just wander in later. So if you guys want to move up a little bit closer, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and then we can let people fill in the back. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to do a welcome and an introduction. And then we're going to let our presenters show their work. And then um, Professor Field is going to facilitate a discussion and a question answer session with you all. So we're going to sit and talk about what we, what we watched today. So um, my name is Daylena Hunter, and I'm the librarian here at the Center for African American Studies. And, um, and we've been doing this series for a couple of years now. Um, it started because there's just a lot of conversations about um, how black people are represented in the media um, very generally. And I know that um, there's a class that Allie teaches um, that deals with the same issue. But it seemed like um, everyone had wasn't always necessarily on the same page. We've all seen very different movies. We all come into the conversation very from very different places, different disciplines. Some of us just watch movies. Other of us, others of us think about movies. Other of us, others of us publish about movies. So I thought that um, having a film series around it would allow us all to sit down, watch some films, and kind of discuss what we thought or what we felt about it in a way that we could take it away with us. Um, so the next time we go to the movies or turn on the TV or sit down and write that paper, we can really think more deeply about what it is we're seeing, how it comes about, um, what are the different aspects of movie making that affect the final products that we're seeing. Um, so I, I just started organizing the film series around that, and this is our third year. Um, so this year, um, I decided to focus on, on women um, because the previous years, it was kind of general. I got a lot of men, and it was really great. Um, but then I went to the uh, LA Rebellion screening, and I said, hmm, there's only very few women here <laughs> in this screening. So how could we do something where we focus just a little bit more on, on a woman's perspective? So um, hence the title of this one is it's, uh, Black Women and, the, and um, Norma Normativity. I didn't make up that part of the title. <laughs> um, so I'd like to welcome you guys here today for that. Um, and I'll just start with the introduction. So um, actually, I'll start with our first our first presenter is going to be Zaina Buirene Davis. Um, Zaina Buirene Davis is an independent filmmaker and professor of communication at University of California, San Diego. Her work is passionately concerned with the depiction of women of African descent. Um, Ms. Davis works in narrative, documentary, and experimental genres. A selection of her award-winning works include Mother of, the, Mother of the River, a drama about a young slave girl for both children and adults, A Powerful Thing, a love story set in Afro-Ohio, and Cycles, an experimental narrative exploring the cycle, spiritual, and journey of a woman. Her dramatic feature film, entitled Compensation, features two interrelated love stories that offer a view of black deaf culture. She has recently released two documentaries, Co-Motion, Stories of Breastfeeding Women, and Momentum, a conversation with black women on achieving grad degrees. She is currently working on a documentary, Spirits of Rebellion, Black Cinema at UCLA, a feature-length documentary that features the work and legacy of a group of African-American filmmakers from UCLA whose work focuses on media for social change. Ms. Davis has received numerous grants and fellowships for from such sources such as the National Black Programming Consortium, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Her films are distributed by Third World Newsreel, Newsreel and Women Make Movies in New York and have been broadcast on PBS, BET, Stars, and the Sundance Channel. She frequently writes on film. Her most recent piece is an April 2013 interview with Shola Lynch, um, producer, director of Free Angela and All Political Prisoners, for the online black cinema magazine, Shadow and Act. Ms. Davis is also one of the founding members of the Black Film Society of San Diego, a group whose mission is to create unique black film experiences. And our second part, oh, you guys. <laughs> and our second artist today is Melissa Hayslip. Uh, Melissa Hayslip was born in Boston and raised in the US Virgin Islands, Connecticut, and New York. She attended Yale University. After a 25-year career as a professional Broadway stage performer and film and television actor, 
Ms. Hazlett moved to Los Angeles to work in development at the American Film Institute and began casting for independent features including Forty, a multi-storyline international thriller set in Turkey and Africa. Forty won the Golden Orange Award for Best New Talent at the Antalya International Film Festival in Turkey in 2009 and then premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival screened at Osaka and received special jury mention in Palm Springs in 2011. Hazlett received the 2013 Chaz and Roger Ebert Fellowship at the 2013 Film Independent Spirit Awards uh, while participating in Film Independent's 20th anniversary class project involved. She also produced the short film You're Dead to Me, directed by Wu Sang, which will air on PBS and screen at the Los Angeles Film Festival this June. Her feature documentary work in progress, Mr. Soul, Ellis Hayslip and the Birth of Black Power TV screened at the annual film independent project involved showcase at the Academy's Linwood Doug Theaters. The film also screened at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's 41 annual independent film series. Ms. Hayslip is currently a fellow in Stanley Nelson's Firelight Media Producers Lab, um, and she also participated in the, in the Producers Guild of America's Diversity Workshop in 2011. And she founded Shoes in the Bed Productions, an independent film production company producing cinematic works of nonfiction with an emphasis on diverse new voices and filmmakers of color. Hazlip has received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Black Programming Consortium, and ITBS and Diversity Development Fund. Currently, Hazlip is in production with Mr. Soul with several projects in development. And finally, I'm going to introduce <laughs> So finally, I'm going to introduce um, Professor Allison Nadia Field. Um, she's going to facilitate the discussion at the end. Um, so Allison Nadia Field is Assistant Professor of Cinema and Media Studies at UCLA and is a faculty affiliate in the Moving Image Archive Studies Program and African American Studies at UCLA. Her primary research interest is in race and ethnicity in American film, including non-theatrical film production, independent cinema, and Hollywood. Her research interests also include avant-garde, no, avant-garde, and experimental filmmaking, transatlantic modernism, and global silent era cinemas. She is the faculty advisor for the student group Elevate in UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, dedicated to giving voice and visibility to the diverse contrib contributions of multicultural filmmakers, theater practitioners, and scholars. She teaches courses on, Af on American film history, research methodology and film studies, film and social change, and topics in African American cinema. She, she is currently completing a book titled Filming Uplift and Projecting Possibility on African American Uplift Cinema of the 1910s. She is also working on an archival preservation project with the UCLA Film and Television Archive on the LA Rebellion of Black filmmakers from the 1970s to the 1990s, and co-curated a major film exhibition of their work, which ran from October to December 2011, at UCLA as part of the Getty Foundation's Pacific Standard Time, and which is currently traveling nationally and internationally. With Jan Christopher Horak and Jacqueline Stewart, she is editing a book on the group titled To Emancipate the Image, the LA Rebellion of Black Filmmakers. In fall 2010, she co-curated the film series Painted Black, revisiting black exploitation in African American cinema of the 1970s for the UCLA Film and Television Archive. In 2007-2008, she was a Sheila Biddle, Sheila Biddle Ford Foundation Fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard University. She received a master's in film and television studies from the Universiteit van Amsterdam and a PhD in comparative literature from Harvard University. So, <laughs> so thanks all three of you guys for coming here today and for working with me for almost a year to uh, yeah. to organize this series. So, um, I'm going to get us started with with Sandy. Thank you uh, very much, 
Elena, Alex, everybody for having us Bunch Center for still being here, thank God, <laughs> after all these years. So I'm really excited to be back here. I'm a graduate of UCLA FFA program. So it's nice to come back. This is home. So um, I'm really excited and happy to be here. So what I thought I would do today, in addition to showing my own work, was actually show you some work of other women who've gone through UCLA and also let you know who's been through UCLA if you hadn't known of, of, of them before. Um, obviously, well, one of the ones who's probably more prominent right now is uh, Ava DuVernay, whose film, feature film, uh, Middle of Nowhere, was the um, grand prize winner for the first time for a black woman to win the grand prize in directing uh, at the Sundance Festival last year. So she's one of us. I think as well. Um, and then we also have um, not, a, not a, a somebody who went here, but there's a brand new film, bless you, by uh, Shala Lett uh, on uh, Free Angela and All Political Prisoners. And as many of you may know, um, Angela Davis taught here many years ago, right next door, over at Royce Hall. And it was a very, very um, interesting time of student activism in um, just social change that was reflected all throughout the media. So what I'm going to start with is um, a documentary that I started working on um, when I was a, a, a graduate student here uh, in paying homage to my elders who kind of came here and worked here before me. So I'm going to show you just a very brief excerpt from a film that I did, documentary film that I did called Trumpetistic Lucor Bright. And it features um, a black woman trumpet player, uh, originally from Texas, but uh, is an icon here in Los Angeles. Her name is Cora Bryant, uh, and she's still alive. She's 86 in next, at the end of this month, it's May now. So her birthday is the end of the month. She's, she's not performing on the horn anymore, but she still does perform. And um, this feature, this, this section that I'm also gonna show, um, also includes our beloved professor, um, Dr. Beverly Robinson talking about um, uh, Cora's work. And Beverly Robinson was um, a very influential person here uh, who taught here uh, in the 70s and the 80s through to the 90s. Uh, I think all the way 2002 is when she passed away unfortunately from cancer. Um, but she guided many of us here. So I wanted to give homage to them and to pay tribute to all that they left for us as well. children, travels across the United States and Canada, and has long stints in Las Vegas with the Billy Williams Band. In 1957, Flora records Gala with a Horn for the Mold label, her only solo album. Network variety shows bring jazz performers into the nation's living rooms. Here's Flora on June 5, 1960, on America's number one television show. Because I think a lot of the men, especially the musicians, take it for granted. 
where Flora never took her honesty or her expertise for granted. It's a difficult thing for a woman to play a brass instrument and get any kind of recognition because I'm going to be a long time. You get jealousy from the guys and you get jealousy from the women. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so that's just a was inspired by um, the poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was a very famous African-American uh, figure in the early 1900s. He's probably like the, the big star of his day. And um, he, was in, he, he was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and it just so happened that once I left here, UCLA, my first uh, full-time job as a faculty person was in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which is 20 minutes away from Dayton. And so, of course, I had to go pay homage to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And when you walk up the steps to Paul Lawrence Dunbar's home, there's a plaque. And on this plaque is this poem, Compensation. And it just kind of struck me um, when I saw that poem and I wanted to do something visual with it. And the poem talks about love and it talks about kind of knowing about um, what death might bring to a person. And so um, the way that we constructed the story was that there would be two couples played by the same actors. Um, one couple is at the beginning of the 20th century in Chicago. The male uh, protagonist is a meat packing worker. And the female protagonist is a fairly well-to-do middle class black woman who works as a seamstress. Um, the twist in this story is that the, I'm, I'm going to be a spoiler for you, but sorry, hopefully you forget <laughs> when you watch the film, you won't be that way. Um, that he has tuberculosis, which was the leading um, health, uh, you know, trauma of, of the early 20th century. And then we flip over to the end of the 20th century, where 1993 Chicago, which I, sh where I shot this film, is 20 years this summer. Uh, that I shot this film, Compensation. Um, the, 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 the same actors are now the contemporary couple, and their names are Malika and Aniko. Uh, Melindy, an author. Melindy, if you know of Dunbar, Melindy sings. Author is my husband's middle name. He's a screenwriter, so you can say you put him <laughs> um, And then Malika and Nico are um, a contemporary couple, and at the time in 1993 when we produced the film, that was a time when there was a lot of, um, I guess, discussion, uh, not so much hysteria by that point, but there was definitely a lot of discussion um, and concern about being HIV AIDS positive um, at that particular point. And people not realizing that the largest population of HIV was actually amongst African American women um, at that time. The numbers are still relatively high. So the, the contemporary characters deal with with HIV AIDS and the period characters deal with tuberculosis. Where you're coming in the film right now, I just wanted to show you something so we can talk about representation a little later. Where you're coming in the film is um, pretty much right at the beginning. Um, you will see um, Melindy um, and a, another group of women who are bartering. And um, there has to be a unique way that that happens because Melindy is deaf. And then you will meet the, the contemporary characters. So that's the section that I'll play for you. I 
did a lot of historical research, so this is a photograph of Chicago streets, early 1900s. This was a neighborhood in the Broadensville section of Chicago.
kind of joke while we're here, people? That's funny. Spirits of Rebellion, Black Cinema at UCLA. And um, the, some of you may know that there was a group of folks who came through here hey, Nana, um, from the 60s through the 80s or 90s. It sounds like we're kind of like expanding the time period. Thank you. I appreciate that. That, that was a bone of contention a little while ago, but now it's not, so I'm happy to hear that. And um, so this is a feature-length documentary that basically is profiling all the different filmmakers that are in there. There's too many filmmakers to put in one documentary. There's over, how much the last count? 50. 50. There's over 50. So there's no way everybody's going to get in here and, you know, all these people are, are directors, so we all got our little egos and craziness that we are. No. So, you know, right? No, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, I'm basically trying to document as many people as we can and then work with um, Ali and um, um, Chris and, and Jackie to try to compile as much stuff and then whatever's not in the documentary will be in the archive here so people can look at it and then we hope to do a website or a blog so you can also see some of the footage that we didn't, we were not able to put into the film and we'll be able to see that. So again, following along my line of looking at works that have women or, or women who have some kind of connection to uh, UCLA, I wanted to profile, I wanted to show you two profiles of um, women filmmakers who are a part of the group. Um, the first woman most people know, I'm not going to show you that clip because it's not really where I want it to be quite yet, and that's Julie Dash, the director of Daughters of the Dust. Um, that's the one most people know if they know any um, black women filmmakers that came from UCLA. They usually know Julie's name. But I also wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you to some other makers who you might not be aware of, um, whose works are, are also very interesting. And the first one that I'll show with you is um, a sister by the name of Barbara McCullough. Barbara McCullough was here um, in the late 70s through the early 80s, and she works more in what we would call the experimental genre. So she does filmmaking, but she also does things like installations at various art galleries, so on and so forth. So you'll see her here talking about her work, and then I will transition into um, the work of one of the later filmmakers who comes in the 90s, and that's called California, Los Angeles started an experimental program to teach Latino, Asian American, Native American, and Black students how to make fit. So you can do a fast forward real quick. Here's Abby. I know you don't like seeing yourself again, but I was gonna help. I got you. I shot in this room, see? Don't you recognize it? <laughs> right here. So the interview was highly just right in here. Did the filmmaker compensate the center for that? <laughs> yeah, right. No, sorry. The, female, the filmmaker will compensate the center in the fact that we will give you a copy of the film. All right. <laughs> I, I, I would like for anyone who's passing the white wants to add a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you know, learn that, and and then to do a film, it's like, oh my God, it's like, well, what are you doing? Like, she's talking about she's passing, but she's not ashamed. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're film illusion? And so it brought up a lot of questions. I work in recruitment for digital animation effects studio because part of my back background is production management and CG production management and digital operations management. I go to a lot of academic institutions and recruit kids to work in the industry. You know, you're not going to be necessarily a creative person, but you will be able to like make a living. Uh, 15 days till cigarette for two weeks. This is my seventh year. I don't see graphic for rhythm years. And so it's kind of interesting because things change but yet they remain the same and there's always snafus. There's always snafus. It's our major recruiting event, you know, for the you know, for the for the year. And so this position basically gets a chance gets the opportunity <laughs> to, you know, to produce it. And it's it's a lot of work but it's fun. Oh, okay. So, okay. Decisions are facing and then made. Let's just take a look to see what they are. Okay. Okay. The front should be more, more dynamic side. So, that will be the front. Yeah, we have chipmunks. This is going to be our, our big attention runners for the front. Okay. I hope we don't have to, like, redo these two. I hope not. You know, because <laughs> we, I mean, we may have to take more sugar off of that, and I hope we don't have to do that. Okay, but it's good we're talking about this one. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. The political thing at UCLA was really kind of interesting in the film department because you have to have a certain political point of view about everything that you were doing. Otherwise, it was considered a political art form. Say, given that I was trying to find out who I was as a creative person, it wasn't the way that I needed to get my message across. Reflections on ritual space, you know, as Shirley Clark said. Kind of hard to get that on the marquee, but, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's like I couldn't think of anything else. What I wanted to do was create an environment that would do the idea of freeway, not just fetishes, but also objects that are found 
<clears throat> that have beauty beyond what you would normally think of. You know, pieces of fragments of wood that you see, tires and tailpipe and tumbling sand. So all these objects basically have significance in terms of an original location, and at the same time is reflective on what you see maybe on the side of a freeway. At the same time, basically just things that I felt like, you know, belonged, you know, with this piece. Roses for protection, and then the circle of continuity. And then I have the collar shells, which brings about a thought of divination, but also um, that's use for exchange. The middle space, the, the circular space that comes, protrudes out from the sand that's on the wall is like an altar. And you can have an altar anywhere, you know, it doesn't have to be just in the house with a nice cloth on it, it doesn't have to be in a church, it can be anything that you want to do to commemorate or to um, to garner energy or to um, show respect or to cleanse and ask for grace. And it can be any kind of object that can do that for you. It can be broken glass, you know, that you arrange in a certain way that gives you a feeling of relief or release or you know, a recognition of a certain kind of beauty. I'm returning to Rhythm and Unity. Right. Okay, so I've been there for seven years now. So I resigned last week. I'm going to Savannah College of Art and Design. Wow. Yeah, so I will be in Georgia and you are in? Yeah, Alabama. So you're right next door? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. It'll be fun for us to meet someplace. The book is different from the South. <laughs> yeah, really, because for me, I haven't, you know, all my life has been here. This is actually been a really nice way to lead a life. She's moving, that's why everything moving. is in transition. Woo! Is it ever? Let's see. The lights get over. The lights get over here. People say this all the time to me that I always look like somebody. I have one of those faces where I guess mm -hmm. I remind people of other people, but when I'm in, I was like, we look alike. We oh. really we really do look alike. It's funny. Oh. I was like, when you said it, I said, oh, that yeah, that must be her. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's Leslie, amazing artist. Cool. Uh, I have an article. Here we go. It's a nice spread. Oh, wow. Isn't that great? Ooh. I don't have one. I have to go to the newsstand and buy a bunch of these. Yeah. So yes, it just came out. It just came out. I just got it this morning. Yeah. And then I put it in a nice big one. I love this one. Yeah. When I first, I was just like, when I saw it on the computer, I was just like. <laughs> That's one of the time, and so that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And painting stuff. Yeah, so. that's it. Congratulations. Thank you. This is good stuff. I know. I can send this to my mom. I'm like, see? Mm -hmm. see? I don't know how you, your family, do they? Well, you're a professor, so that's very respectable. Like, well, but still, it's kind of like, you know. What do you do with that? Yeah, what do you do? <laughs> I, I went to UCLA because of the legend of the LA Rebellion filmmakers. You drive on, so it was a shameless attempt to sort of speak to those films. But Killer of Sheep, you can see, like when I watch that movie, I can see what's behind the camera. You can see the neighborhood, and you can feel it all there. And um, now, like in the art world, there's this real trend towards art making that's embedded in a community, right? They call this social practice or public culture. Like, here's a picture of my my African American neighbors, and I bought their house, and then I live next door to them. It's like the artists will just take an exchange and turn it into art. So, so makes me think about shooting dreadlocks of. 1104 Magnolia, because I'm packing, I found the exact address, and I was like, that's right, 1104 Magnolia, Oakland, California. My film is called Dry Long Soul, which means 
ordinary or everyday people. And um, it's about a young woman who has convinced herself that black men are an endangered species are going to be extinct. And she's documenting them with this Polaroid camera. Can I take your picture? Nah, nah, I, I don't think so. Please, just for a class assignment. Okay, I'll do it. How, how do you want me? Can I check the belly? Teenage boys come up, you need any help? You, need, you got any work? Like, you know what I mean? So they're like, okay, look here, you pay $25 this afternoon. But that meant that my group had to train this kid, or my gaffer had to train the kid. So then we're like training people how to make films. And I, I was not, this is not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was to shoot the film. But two weeks into this, I look around, there's like three teenage girls hanging out with a makeup artist. My gaffer has like, any, at any given time, between two and six boys between nine and 15 following him around, um, carrying cables and lights or whatever he says, go get it, they'll do it, they're doing it. There's like uh, these uh, other little girls over here and just hanging out with the actresses, like doing their hair and just chatting with them. Um, I go up to the production office, there's two other teenage girls that are doing some filing. And I'm, all I can think, quite honestly, is how much is this costing me in lunch? Because they're, everybody was always there at lunchtime. So it's like my crew of 12 people and then, I don't know, 24 some odd other rug rats <laughs> that I was feeding every day for a month. But but so but I'm thinking I'm remembering all this because to me that was just like the battle of shooting the film and getting it done. I'm remembering this while I'm listening to artists talk about their social practice, and I was realizing that actually the LA Rebellion filmmakers, from the, without having a neighbor, they they did that immediately. That was a given. It wasn't until recently that I realized how much of that sort of ethic I absorbed. After we left L 1104 Magnolia, the, it was boarded up when we took it over. We painted it inside and out. We put in a water heater. We like made repairs so that we could shoot in it. And two months after we left, the owner sold that house. But that's that's no small thing. That's like that. What do you call that? Community redevelopment. We don't have Hollywood behind us. We don't have a studio backing us. What we have is our neighborhood. That's that's who's gonna get our movie made. That's amazing. You're a production assistant, you gotta be. Yeah. This is my oldest daughter, Mozzie. That's <laughs> a teacher, my daughter, Mozzie. Huh? Cut her off. Sorry. <laughs> Stay tuned. Their flagship uh, diversity uh, fellowship called Project Involved. 
So they actually can uh, commission this project. So it, uh, the short will not only screen at the LA Film Festival, but also on PBS. They have the honor of owning it for three years. Uh, so it will be webcast probably on the uh, NBPC National Black Program Programming Consortium's hot webcast. And then as soon as they're done with it, we will uh, submit it to all the festivals for the following year. Today I thought I would share with you a project I'm currently working on. It's a feature length documentary called Mr. Soul, Ellis Hazel and the Birth of Black Power TV. Now, Mr. Soul is a very special project, very near and dear to my heart. It's about a groundbreaking, pioneering individual by the name of Ellis Hazlett. You notice the last day, you're probably thinking there's some connection. <laughs> my uncle Ellis Hazlett, uh, who was a pioneer, a producer, a visionary, and a very unique individual from Washington, D.C. Grew up in Washington, D.C., went to Howard University, went on to become an extraordinary uh, producer, both theatrically, and then in 1968, he had the fortuitous opportunity to become the first African-American host on PBS to also direct and produce and host a brand new television show that had never been seen before nationwide, which was called Soul. Some of you may remember it. It did actually yeah. make its way out once PBS went nationwide in 1969 after the Public Broadcasting Act. Uh, it was aired nationwide. And so Seoul ran from 1968 to 1973. It was groundbreaking because it was the first opportunity for African Americans to actually be seen in mirroring their own community with dancing singing, politics, activists, leaders in the community. It's a highly unusual format. I don't want to give too much away. We'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> but what, what I put together here is a 21-minute work in progress. We have, we're still actually shooting right now. We've received grants that have helped us to continue to do so. And our most recent grant is from the uh, ITVS. It's the Diversity Development so on Monday, we'll be going to New York and shooting more interviews with uh, Cicely Tyson, uh, Julian Bond, uh, I think we're also, oh, Louis Messiah from the Scribe Center, Scribe Video Center, and also the poet Sonia Sanchez. So what we're doing is interviewing many of the artists who were on this show from 1968 to 1973. We're also interviewing pundits, uh, social commentary, people who were involved in the production, people who were behind the camera, in front of the camera. We think it's very important to tell this story. What's interesting about my being here today, and you might say, well, why are you showing a film about predominantly about a man? Well, the truth is, it was about a man who had a vision for our culture and for our people. It was a tumultuous time in history. It was a show that really didn't have the possibility to air. If you think about 1968, Martin Luther King being assassinated on April 4th, this show aired on September the 8th, 1968. And it was such a platform, not only was it a, a vehicle for African American artistry, but it was also a platform for political discussion and the fight for social justice, all of which really hadn't been seen for, before in this type of format. We had Ed Sullivan, we had the Smothers Brothers, but we didn't have an opportunity to really see ourselves. And so another thing that's really beautiful, which ties into the theme today of women and marginalization, is that it was a platform for women on the, on the heels of the women's movement. Never before had black female poets had this type of platform. So we'll see some people that you may know, like uh, Novella Nelson, uh, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, and others. I thought also, you know, when I first started putting this together and putting together a team, people would say to me, well, you're producing it, but you should make sure that you direct it too. And I'm like, no, I'm going to get a really big, famous director to do that, you know, Spike Lee or Dave Messiah or, or Sam Pollard or somebody like that. And I was able to 
get a fiscal sponsorship from Women Make Movies, which is uh, very important because a fiscal sponsor allows you to receive funds as a 501c3 uh, organization. It's a fancy way to launch your money. <laughs> but it's the only way that you can receive grants because grants aren't given to individuals anymore. So Women Make Movies, I had a mentor there and she said, Melissa, you have no idea how important it is that you are a woman directing this film. Most women in, in documentaries take a professorial role or they'll step, step back and allow the project to be capably handled by someone who has a little more machismo. And I thought, you know, I want to stay behind the scenes. But then I decided that was, that was probably the best advice I've been given in my career to date. Because I knew as a first time filmmaker, grant after grant after grant, I kept getting turned down because nobody knew who I was. So I said, okay, well, I'll find a wonderful director who will understand the project and share my passion and allow me still to help it with him. So now we have Sam Pollard, who's a wonderful director. You may have seen his film, uh, Slavery by Another Name, uh, which came out at Sundance two years ago. And also he has edited and produced and directed, not directed, but edited and produced at least seven or eight Spike Lee films. So, so Sam and I are working together but it was very important for me as a woman to be able to tell the story and to stand on the shoulders of my uncle who made the possibilities for women at a time, and for black women especially, when that really wasn't possible. So I put together about 21 minutes, as you can see. Uh, we're just gonna show that all together all at once, and you'll see basically how the film will uh, pan out. But keep in mind, it is a rough cut. It's not the entire film. I just picked the highlights of the best interviews we've done so far and all the fabulous footage that we could show you that we were able to wrestle away from PBS Channel 13. I should mention that the original show, what made it so unusual was that it was live, that it was the first time that many African-American artists had been seen. Many, you can imagine, if you were lucky enough to go to the Apollo Theater, or you're on the Chitlick circuit, or you're listening to the radio, you got to hear your favorite artists, but you didn't see them. So this show fundamentally launched many of the careers of most, if not, I dare say, well, let's just stick with most, of the African-American icons of the 20th century. So you'll see a lot of them here, and um, I can't wait to discuss it with you afterwards. So without further ado, we'll show you clips from Mr. Soul, and it's 21 minutes in its entirety. Thank you. 
who were uh, performing on the show uh, were uh, some of the best. Once in my life, I have someone to meet me, someone I've been here so long. All of us are great, and no one like me.
simply not able to make the kind of film that you've seen there. Uh, the powers that be would not permit it. They would not give us $2 million. Uh, uh, before B&I came along, they wouldn't give Stephen Fletcher uh, a part that was commensurate with his talent or his dignity as a human being. Uh, uh, so, we grew out of Stephen Fletcher. We grew out of Mantan Holland. Uh, out of us will come yet directors and producers who will have infinitely more freedom. Uh, this freedom that we have and the freedom that they will have comes from the strength that has been husbanded now in the black community and is being felt politically, economically, and philosophically throughout the land. I thank you very much for being with us, and I'm going to uh, turn things over to Lavella Nelson once again. We were all very excited because we knew it was something new and special, but we did not know what it would be in the end. It was, I don't know how to explain it, the air was electric. All recollection of the first year is cemented forever with Wilson Pickett and Larry Williams in the last show of the year together. Dancing. The whole audience is dancing. Oh, I did it.